And if you're in the Blue Bible, we are on page 451 and 452. And if you don't have a Bible, please take this Bible as our gift to you. The King's Banquets. Now in the days of Azurus, the Azurus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 pro provinces, in those days when King Azurus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, porphyry marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavish according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the woman in the palace that belonged to King Azurus. Queen Vashti's Refusal on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Ab. Abagatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Azarus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him began being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Mer Meris, Marsena, and Mumukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti, because she has not performed the command of King Azarus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Mamukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Azarus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Azurus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble woman of Persia and Media, who have heard all the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it is, ple if it is please the king... If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Azurus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and, so, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I'm just a science teacher. I'm just a science teacher. Way to set the bar low and way to jump way over that bar, Allie Biederman. Uh, we get to walk through the book of Esther. If you're new to our church, welcome. My name's Josh. I'll be over there at coffee afterwards if you want to come talk with X and I. X is Xavier. He goes by X or Xavier. 
Uh, but as a church, one of the things we do here a lot is we just open up a book of the Bible on a Sunday, and then we work our way through that. That's not everybody's tradition, but that's what we do. And the way we decide on that is the year prior, the lead pastors and people get together and just pray, what do we want for our people? What books of the Bible do we need? And we sort of take a healthy diet of New Testament Old Testament. We finished the book of Revelation at the end of last year, and now we're in this Old Testament story of Esther. That's exactly what it is. It's a story. It's a true story, but it's a story. So we're about to spend the next few weeks, two months or so, walking through this story. Here's the breakdown. I'm not going to give a ton of front-end work to you. Here's the breakdown of Esther here. It's the setup, chapter 1. Chapter 2 next week, there's a major conflict, chapters 3 through 7, and then there's a wonderful celebration, which Jews to this day still celebrate, Purim, which is sort of the Jewish Halloween, a lot of people say. It's a big festival, and it comes out of this book here in this story we're about to walk through. Last service, about 40% of the people said they were familiar with the book, which means I'm assuming, similar in here, most of us aren't that familiar. Why are we diving into this book? Why did the pastors feel led to open this book. Here's sort of the undergirding question behind the book of Esther. Is how do you live in a world without God? Whether you say our society is godless and moving in a bad direction, or you live in a family where you're the only Christian, whatever it may be, how do you live, navigate, faithfully follow Jesus in a world where it seems like there is no God? That's why we're going through Esther. I think everybody on some heart level wrestles with that question in some area of their life. Some of us maybe wrestle with that a lot based off our vocation, where we're at. We're surrounded by people that don't think like us. But how do you live in a world where God is not there? That's what we're going to do. We're going to look at two things here. We're going to look at some kings. I'm going to compare two kings today, and then I'm going to give us two pastoral invitations into this book. So that's what I want to do with us this morning. But one of the things that I try to do as we kick off a book is give you all time and space just to sit quietly, close your eyes, and pray, and you to ask God to meet you through the study of Esther. So let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, and ask God to meet us. God, you say your word is breathed out by you. It's profitable. It's good for us. It's rarely easy or the obvious decision we would make, but it's good for us. So I pray that you would be good to us through the book of Esther over the next few weeks we have together as a church. Lord, be in this room. May your spirit give wisdom and open up this wonderful story of Esther. Lord, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the tale of two kings is sort of how I think about this book. Here's the first king. The tale of two kings. The first king, I'm going to call him Xerxes because that's his name. He is the king that you can't miss. So what Ali just read, there's a name in there that's really hard to say. I'm going to say it differently than Ali, but that doesn't make me better. Uh, Verse 1. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, which is modern day Iran. So we're talking about this guy, Ahasuerus. Who is he? He's Xerxes. He's Xerxes. Well, why the mishap? That's his Persian name on his left. That's the Greek way people refer to him. Xerxes is all over history. I was talking to a high school teacher in the first service and said, do you still do world history? He said, not as much. It's more college. So maybe we don't have a lot of Greek history, but Xerxes is very common in all history books regarding this time period. It's Xerxes. That's what we're going to call him. So every time we get to that crazy Ahasuerus name, I'm just going to say Xerxes and just roll with me. Now, where was he king? He reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, and he sat on the throne in Susa. So where is that? India to Ethiopia. Here's a map that you could all pull up if you were as good at Google as I am. This is where the Persian Empire is. So all the way to North Africa, you see Egypt there, purple. That's the beginning of the Persian Empire. All the way to India. Kazakhstan, interesting, up on top. The Reyes family, a dear family to this church, moved to Kazakhstan for military reasons. But they're just above the Persian Empire. In this 127 provinces, no commentator really knows what's being talked about. Because it's at best, people think it's like 23 provinces, the way they talked about. The most insightful and I think 
funny way people said is this is sort of an exaggeration right out of the gate just to show you what sort of leader this is. How big of his empire? 120 provinces. How long did you rule? Exaggeration, exaggeration, exaggeration. But this is King Xerxes. When was he king? Again, if you're a history person, you care a lot. If you're not a history person, you should care a little bit. 486 to 465 BC. Just on a personal note, the history in the Bible drew me in and solidified my faith as much as any other thing. Because I grew up just with a scary notion of God. I got saved, became a Christian through a baseball camp at the end of high school. I fall in love with Jesus, start following him. But I start studying the Bible and realize, oh, this book is not like up in the clouds. All this stuff is here on earth. There's some crazy stuff in it, but everything is happening here on the ground. Why? Because God acts in history. He comes down and he's among his people. He's working here in the details of history. So what's being talked about in this story is a king who was actually king from 486 B.C., to 465 BC. You movie buffs, the movie 300, a great, epic, very gory, very rated R movie. That happened at 480 BC. So a movie, one of my favorite movies I saw years and years ago when I first saw it, the history it's recounting is happening during this time. So all that to say, we're talking about a real king named Xerxes. But here's the point. What sort of king is Xerxes. We've got two kings to compare. Here's the first one. I'm going to walk through. There's going to be six things that he does in this opening chapter to just give us a flavor of what this man was like. Let's read verse three and four. What was he like? Here's the first thing he does is he gives this massive feast. It says, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed the richest of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days to be exact. Third year of his reign, so it's 483 B.C., and he parties for six months. Just to give us context, January, we're going to have a president, Biden or someone else. They come into office or they stay in, and they kick off their presidency with a six-month party. January to July, they're spending tax dollars to celebrate their greatness, America's greatness, and <laughs> Terry has no filter, and I love it. But that's what's happening. 180 D feasts, uh, we're just going to party, party hard. Why is this happening now? So again, this is all happening in history. 490, the concept of the marathon becomes a reality because there's a battle called Battle of the Marathon, Battle of Marathon. And what history tells us is a man ran 26.2 miles from that battle, gets to back to his people in Greece and said, we won, and then drops over and dies. And they start a tradition, the marathon, because the Battle of Marathon. What was the Battle of Marathon? It was Persia, these people, going to battle with Greece and losing. It's like, the first, it's like round one of a good boxing match. Greece hits him with a jab, and now in this context, Xerxes is gathering people to kind of bow up and say, I'm not done with this fight yet. Let's gather everyone around, and he wants to keep going to battle with Greece, with the Greeks, and that's a part of history that if you open up any history book, will be there. Marathon happened. I'm going to get my people and just show them the pomp and the riches and everything I have. Look how great I am. 180-day party. January to July, buying their Trump or whoever, parties for six months. What do you do at the end of a six-month party? Verse 5 through verse 7. Here's what Xerxes does. He extends the party for seven more days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, now a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains, violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen, and purple to silver rods, marble pillars, and also the couches were gold and silver. It was all on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Verse 7, the most annoying detail of all of it. And drinks were all served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Not the wine part. I'm fine with that. 
Everyone was drinking out of golden goblets, and no golden goblet was the same. Why? So Xerxes could say, look at how amazing I am. You go to the Watt House, you get the same plastic cup as every other schmo. <laughs> Xerxes gives you your finest, most unique golden goblet, and they all drink up the finest of wine. Look at me, look at me. Me, 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 I love myself. I have my picture on my shelf. A pastor in <laughs> Dallas used to recite when his wife was making fun of him for being so selfish, and that's what we're seeing with Xerxes here. He just, look at me. And this book is hard to preach in one way. There's a ton of like moral stories that the leader, preacher, parent, discipler can take and make mean something. And I don't want to do that all the time, but in this case, I just want us to know. Xerxes lived in a time where it was very hard to be self-promotional. We live in a time where the most unimpressive person in this room can present something pretty impressive and get a number of views or likes or clicks or whatever. So just be careful on your desire to show off your golden goblet lifestyle for better or for worse. We're seeing Xerxes. My counselor I got, got to meet with probably every month or two tells me a few things regularly, but one thing he says is, fight to stay small, fight to stay small, fight to stay small. And that's not like unique to me. He t pastors live in this day and age where the desire is to be bigger than God has ordained you to be. Stay small, stay small. Xerxes says, bah, I don't need to listen to that. Verse 8, seven-day Mardi Gras party happening. Verse 8, here's more description of that party. And drinking was according to this edict. Edict is an official order from the authority. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. And Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Xerxes. What happens here? He says there is no compulsion. Commentators are trying to figure out what exactly this means. It can mean one of two things. Here's one of the options on what he means when the edict comes from the king to describe how the drinking should happen. Each person can decide how to party based on their own desires. It was a very eclectic uh, kingdom. All the different tribes and people and tongues and nations were a part of this. So Somalians party like Somalians. Mexicans party like Mexicans. That could mean that. Or more likely it means there will be absolutely no constraint at this party. Either way, here's what we see. This king, mighty, glorious, wonderful, in-charge king, having to dictate how every part of the party goes, even down to two guys sharing a beer together. Here's what the king says how this should happen. Edict from King Xerxes. This is the king that the Jews are under in this place right now. It's just painting a picture for us to like, oh, I know a couple guys like this. Let's keep reading. Verse 10 through 12, he then gives another commandment. On the seventh day, when the heart, so seven days of just straight drinking, the most obvious statement ever, the heart of the king was merry with wine. He commanded Mehuman, Bissa, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Xerxes, to bring Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. And at this, the king, who was drunk, became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So now the story is, he says, go get my queen. Vashti means the best or the most beautiful one. And have her bring her crown and parade before my men. A lot of this story, God does not connect all the moral dots on what's happening. He could be asking for Queen Vashti to come wearing only a crown, which was highly likely in this society, or make sure she has her crown on as she parades her way in front of my men. This is the king that opens up this book. And Vashti says no. So again, you're left with a moment with, why did Vashti say no? 
we could go a lot of different offshoots right now. She was the first feminist in the feminist movement that we... <laughs> she just had enough of dealing with Xerxes. Likely, based off just marriages and marriage counseling I see all the time, she just didn't want this right now. And she's like, no. Kind of a common instance in most husband and wife's interactions. <laughs> Which one you pick, you send it whatever way you want to send it. The story doesn't fill in the dots. It does fill in this dot, though. This king does not look great right out of the gate. Calls his wife, come here. She says, no. All right. He's the most powerful man in the world. How do you respond when your wife says no? Let's keep reading. Verse 13 through 18. Then the king sent to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. I love it. It's an interaction between a husband and wife. And it's like, what's the law say? Let's get the lawyers. And it's like, oh my gosh. So funny. The next one being Karshina, Sethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memekin, the seven princes of Persian media who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Xerxes delivered by the eunuchs. What does the law say about a wife saying no to her husband? I like it. Then Memekin said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Xerxes. She didn't do one man wrong. She did a whole kingdom of men wrong. Why? Verse 17. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. My wife didn't listen to me. I'm going to make a new law for my wife. The worst leaders I know are hyper-control freaks. The worst family cultures are created often by hyper-control freaks, by the mom or the dad. The worst marriages involve hyper-control freaks. The worst kingdoms on earth are led by hyper-control freaks. And that's what we're seeing with Xer Xerxes here. Well, I'm just going to fix this situation with all my control. What's the wise thing the men come up with? Here's what they're going to do. Verse 17, let's read again. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all the women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him. She didn't come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. This is going to destroy the kingdom. This wife's one refusal is the end of the kingdom. We must step in. So he gives another law, verse 19. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be repealed. We're going to write this in stone. This is going to be an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that Vashti is never again to come before King Xerxes and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Her name means best. Just an interesting play on words. Verse 20. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom for its vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. I could just see the grins on the faces as the men are right. We've had a lot of good ideas in our lifetime, but this could be the best. <laughs> this advice pleased the king and the princes. Of course it did. And the king did as Memekin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language. Indians got their language. Africans got it in their language. Sent it out to the whole kingdom. What does it say? Every man may be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. Meaning if it was like a... Spanish-speaking person married to an English person. It's whatever the husband wants the language to be will be the language of the home. Two rules he makes. Queen Vashti is done. She's never allowed to see me again. 
and every man in my kingdom now is the master of his house. And they will speak the language that the master of the house wants to speak. Signed in ink, King Xerxes. This is the beginning of the book of Esther. Fascinating story of a clown of a man. I said there was the tale of two kings. This is really the only king that's written about directly in this book. Xavier Salazar, our other pastor, made the point. He's like, this feels like the opening of Dark Knight. That would be Batman, the best Batman movie ever made. How does it open up? With the Joker robbing a bank and using all of his little henchmen and then having them killed. And he runs off with all this money to start the Dark Knight. The Dark Knight is about the Dark Knight, but it opens with this picture of the Joker. What is Esther about? It's about Esther. And yet it opens with this picture of the Joker himself, King Xerxes, which takes us to the other king in this story that's harder to notice. I'm going to call him the king that you can't see. Esther has been, for the first 700 years of church history, nobody wrote a commentary on it. So it's part of the canon, and yet no one touches it. And then a few people start to pick it up, but even people that start to pick it up say, I have a hard time with this book. Martin Luther being one of them. Key to our faith as Protestants. He'd say, I have a hard time with it. Why? Because there is no mention of the other king. It's all just a bunch of people on the ground in this little Persian empire. One lecturer got to the heart of it, people's angst with this whole book. Here's how he describes Esther. It contains no promise to the church. I'm talking about the book of Esther. It makes no mention of the gospel, has no type or prophecy of the Messiah, does not introduce the name of God, does not recognize his providence, reveals none of those precious and fundamental doctrines found elsewhere in the Old Testament, and is not quoted in the New Testament, not even once. Not even the book of Hebrews where it's like naming everybody. And this guy got out of the den. And this guy did this. And then this lady did this. And this. Nothing about Esther. Ever in the rest of the Bible. John Adair, a guy we did a training with to prepare for preaching this. Here's the purpose of the book in his mind. The book of Esther is telling the story of a hidden God. Providentially orchestrating the salvation of his people from certain death. There are two kings... Xerxes, who you can't miss, and God, who you can't see, ever, based how the writer wrote this book. There are two kings, the one that's so obvious, and the one you wish was written in, but he's not. What do we do with this? What is Esther inviting us into, this beautiful, twisted story? What's it inviting us into? I think as pastor of this church, one of the pastors... I've been praying, thinking, what are the things that I want this book to do for me and for us? Here's the first invitation I think Esther is giving us. Esther gives us permission to laugh at the king. When was Esther written? After this time. Even conservative guesses. Esther was penned after Xerxes is off the scene. He's had his butt handed to him multiple times by the Greeks. There's a great movie, 300. You can go see just how bad the Greeks gave it to the Persians under Xerxes' leadership. He loses, 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 loses. And the opening scene of Esther is this glorious, pompous celebration of his might as he prepares for one of these battles that he loses. Why? Because God wants his people to have faith and to be able to laugh regardless of the situation. And that we're introduced to this guy, Xerxes, who if it had been written 40 years prior, 50 years prior, 100 years prior, he would have seemed more untouchable than ever. Yet, here's the end of how he's introduced in chapter 1. Just a reminder. He can't even figure out how to be a married guy. Verse 20. The decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout his kingdom. It's vast. Here's his decree. All women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This pleased the king and the princess, as the king did, as Memekin proposed. And he sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language. 
Every man is master in his own household, and they will speak according to the language of his people. Jews in this time are reading this, knowing the fate and destiny of Xerxes. He sends out an edict to control every household in the empire, and he can't even keep the empire himself. Why? Because God wants Xerxes to be laughed at, period. He wants us to be able to laugh at those who think they're in charge. How does that apply to us? I don't always get political, but when I do, it's usually awesome. <laughs> Come January, we'll have somebody in office that some of you will be excited about, some of you will be furious about. Reality. Between now and then, we're all wrapping our hearts around different things we're trusting in to get us through this life. Just the thing I've noticed. Christians often can say with their mouth, I trust in God as sovereign. And with their actions and words and anxiety and stress, say something totally different, that they really think the next guy is the thing that's going to control and make this world better. And the reality is, it's going to be some version of Xerxes, no matter who gets voted in. I've never heard a president say, my job was given to me by God. Romans. I'm here to steward that which God owns. I am his servant. I will serve him. Never heard that. From anyone, from either side. I hear, if you go for that guy or that party, you're doomed. So vote me. What? 2024. <laughs> Can we just all agree to try to laugh a little bit more at those who talk like they're in charge when they're not? Both sides. I don't care who you vote for. I care how you think about voting and that you're involved in this process. I care deeply. It affects a lot of things. Our Arizona ballot will have some big stuff on it. But we as Christians must laugh at those who say, I'm running this place. Because there's only one king who's running this place. His name is Jesus, not fill in the blank. Just to give you another picture, Psalm is the soundtrack for the Christian faith. Psalms, there's 150 of them. Psalm 1 is the story of how we're to anchor our hearts in the word of God, Psalm 1. Psalm 2, what is it about? I'm going to read it to you. This is how God says we should view the world. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves up. Xerxes, fill in the blank. Putin, whoever you want. Your principal at your school, whoever thinks they're running something. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. That's the plans of the world. He, God, who sits in the heavens, laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king, his name is Jesus, on my holy hill that I'm in charge of, period. Anyone else who doesn't agree with that, laugh. That's all you can do. First invitation. Esther is not going to mention God once, but we're going to laugh a lot at those who are in charge. And that's a good Christian practice. We honor, we respect, we vote, we pray for those in charge. But we also laugh at Xerxes, who really thinks this world runs because of his decrees and edicts. He can't manage his own household, let alone an empire. We laugh. Here's the other invitation, and this is more in line with, I think, why God has us here. The book of Esther is inviting us into an Esther-flavored faith more than an Elijah-themed faith. You say, I don't know Elijah, and I don't really know Esther. Elijah is this wonderful Old Testament prophet who has all these beautiful interactions with God. He prays and it rains. He prays. He's in this battle with all these false teachers of the day. He prays, God, bring down fire on this. And God brings down fire and then he kills the false teacher. Like every interaction of his life is this divine, beautiful, big moment where God really shows up in his life. And it's like, boom, there he is. I named one of my kids Elijah because I love the story so much. It's like, I want my kids to have this faith where God sees them and moves and acts. However, you open up the book of Esther, and you don't get that ever. Not once. 
Not one single beautiful moment where God shows up and says, it was me the whole time. You just get this story where it seems like Xerxes is in charge, but then he's not. And what is God? I think God is inviting us into understanding that an Esther season is still a good season. It's different. It's not maybe what you wanted, but it's still good because the control and sovereign rule of God is still at play. Here's the other thing Esther's going to make us sort of face. Like, we are a Reformed-ish church. If you know what that means, great. But people say, oh, I'm here because it's a Reformed church. I say, what do you mean by that? Some people say we're Reformed, meaning we teach the Bible. And we teach it pretty good, depending on who's teaching. I was like, okay, I get whatever. <laughs> reformed people, like my Reformed pastors who are actually Reformed, say we're not Reformed. Because they see Reformed people as baptizing babies, which we don't and reading confessions and creeds for the Reformed faith, which we don't do that either. What do we mean by Reformed? Here's my simple way to say it. God is big. God is in control of everything, way more than I ever expected him to be. My wife grew up in the church, a church that taught not that. So she's this young girl trying to figure out her faith, making bad decisions from time to time and wondering if the world is going to fall on her shoulders because I did bad. She meets an older man who unpacks reformed faith for her and says, you're not that big a deal. God loves you. You are special, but he's in control. The actions of a 17-year-old girl from Chandler are not going to thwart anything in his plan. In fact, he's been directing all your steps up until this point, young lady. Come and be saved. And it was the most freeing moment of her life. Oh, that's what we mean. We're reformed. God is big. There's providence. He's in charge. The fancy way to say it, so people that are actually reformed at churches, they'll be like, yeah, we're reformed. They read this statement out of one of their confessions of faith. What is providence? They say this, God, the great creator of all things, doth, we don't talk about it anymore, but some people do, uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable, that means unchanging counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Some of you are like, I'm glad I'm not reformed. That was way too many words. God the creator directs, disposes, governs all creatures, all things, all actions. Xerxes is in his hand. Your cancer is in his hand. Your divorce is in his hand. Your stupid decisions are in his hand. Everything is under his control. He is providentially guiding this world. Always has been, always will be. And Esther is a beautiful picture showing us that reality, even if it never uses those words. So what's our job as we think about sovereignty and providence? A Puritan writer says, here's a part of being a Christian. It's our duty as the saints, especially in times of straits, that would be boring seasons, cruise control seasons, to reflect upon the performances of providence for them in all the states and through all their stages in their lives. What's he saying? Christian's job is to, in seasons of Esther-like reality, to look back at their life and trace the hand of God over your life so you don't forget. The Esther season is here for a lot of us. I was just, just personally, three years ago we start this church. It's on the tail end of me having some visions. It's like the most charismatic time of my life. I had a dream. I meet with a guy. He had a vision for me. It's like, great. I have had nothing that extravagant from the Lord since. And then I talked to people at this church who planted this church with us, who were single when we planted it and are still single. I talk to people who got married during the life of this church, and they say, it's not, it's not quite what I expected. It's, 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 it's different. In whatever nice way they can say, this is not what I signed up for. <clears throat> Aging people, continually getting pushed to the margins, oftentimes taking care of their parents who are older than them and further on the margins than them even. 
divorced people, middle-aged people who you just kind of hit this season of life where it's the same thing every day, every week. What do you do in those seasons? I'll tell you what sin tells you to do is go light a spark in some way that's going to feel good and make God feel close in some possible way. Esther is going to tell you, open up my book and just see the hand of God behind all of this. I don't know where you're at. I have a sense a lot of us feel more like Esther than Elijah. If you had to write down the last time God spoke, showed up, did something, it would be hard to think of when that last was. He is still at work. Esther is going to show us the beautiful, hidden nature of God in your life, my life, and our life. There's a passage that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably know. And oftentimes it's said in trite ways, but it is true. And I just want to read it to us. Here's, I think, what Esther wants us to remember. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for our good, for those of us who love God. And yet that's very easy to miss in our day-to-day grind of an Esther season. Amen? But all things work together for those who are called according to his purposes. Esther is going to be a beautiful, beautiful book. Two invitations. You can laugh more, especially at those who say they're in charge. And you've been invited into maybe a season you never would have asked for, but you're here, and God's not far away. You may not see him, you may not hear him, but he's there. I promise you, Esther's going to show us time and time again. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the Bible as a whole, the rich, textured nature of your story to us starting in creation in a garden, ending in a garden city for all of eternity for us to enjoy you and each other. And all these beautiful, very human, very divine stories sprinkled throughout. I think of the beautiful nature of Esther, this book that never would have been written if not for your awareness, your fatherly care, and your wise control over all things, to write this down, what happened over 2,000 years ago to this little people that could have been forgotten. So God, just we pray for your smile upon us and for us to sense your smile as we walk through this book together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.